Okay. Hello everybody and welcome to my cooking stream. Today we're going to be making fresh pasta al olio. And uh, you're going to make the pasta by hand using a little bit of semolina flour. Al olio is my great grandmother's recipe. That we've been using for about a hundred years in my family. Excuse me while I just bring up my feet over here. There we go, now I can see everybody in chat. All right, so we're gonna start off first with the, the pasta. I have 200 grams of semolina flour. Normally I don't really like semolina. I prefer to have uh, double zero hard durum wheat. It's the same kind of wheat, it's the same plant, but this one's a little bit coarser. Unfortunately, I live in an area that doesn't really give me access to the other kind of flour that I like, but this will work just fine. So I have 200 grams of the semolina flour, and I have about six grams of salt mixed in there. I pre-measured everything so we can have a good way. So we're going to start by putting it all out on our board, make a little well here, lower the volume here, all right, and I have three eggs in my hand. One is going to be a whole egg and two are going to be just the yolks. We use just the yolks on some of this part just because it'll make it a little bit more stable and give it a little bit better color as well. to see what's going on here with this thing just can't figure out there we go oh I could bring up chat there we are there's the first time I've ever used an iPad to look at chat before unfortunately I don't have a very great setup for it but that's okay so we're gonna start mixing our eggs up in here just keep on mixing them with a fork or your fingers whatever you prefer keep on mixing until you start getting a nice paste going in here and you can start using your hands I'm going to try and mix everything in the well. The flour is going to slowly incorporate in there. While we're doing this, I'll give you a little background here. Um, I live in South Carolina right now. I'm from New Jersey. My family is of, of Italian descent for the most part. So I grew up eating this particular dish very much, although my grandmother never actually made the, uh, the pasta for us. I've also been cooking professionally for about 11 years now. I'm currently the sous chef at a restaurant here in South Carolina, a French restaurant, but I specialize in both French and Italian cooking. One of my favorite things to make aside from fresh pasta is, is souffle, it's on the French side. Now that the uh, egg is kind of mixed up for the most part and I can't really mix it anymore with the fork, I'm gonna start pushing it in with pushing in the rest of the flour with my hands here. Pushing it all in, making sure all this flour is going to get hydrated as best as it can. Depending on the size of your eggs, and depending on the humidity in the air, the time of the year, all that sort of stuff, what you're going to have happen is you're going to have different quantities of flour that you need for your pasta dough. General rule of thumb is for each person that you're going to be feeding is going to be 100 grams of flour. For each 100 grams of flour, another good rule of thumb is going to be to have one egg for every 100 grams. Now I've substituted that with a little bit of the yolk, like I had mentioned before. And seeing as how it's been kind of dry around here lately, it looks like I might need to add a little bit of water to the mix here. So I'll grab a little bit of my faucet, sprinkle it on. And we'll keep on working. All right. 
kind of push it all down, get into a nice ball. You want it to be firm, but not, to, not too, too firm. You want to still be able to have some play with it. It's kind of like having Play-Doh for adults working with pasta. Now we're using this kind of a method of kind of pushing and folding and pushing and folding because what that's going to do is help create gluten strands. And the gluten strands are what gives the pasta its elasticity and what gives it that toothsome kind of a texture. And without that kind of a texture with the pasta, it's just going to be mush. And semolina, as much as I do like to say that I would rather use the other flour that's a little bit finer, this does give you a very extra toothsome kind of a texture just because of the fact that it's a bigger kind of a grain. Pick up on the little pieces here. And I'm going to start forming the ball. Now it seems like it's very firm right now, but that moisture is still being absorbed. So when this pasta rests, because you always have to rest your pasta, otherwise it will be extremely hard to roll out. As you can see, it's even hard just to kind of push all of it together right now. All right, so we have a nice firm ball. The way that you can really tell if it's when it's good and good and uh, Good and elastic for your pasta dough is when you give it a little push on your thumb, it starts coming out. We're not there yet, so we got to keep on massaging the pasta, keep on creating those gluten strands. I'm kind of tucking and folding, bringing everything from the outside up through the middle. I'm going to start rolling it out here in my hand because it's a little bit too hard to be doing that with your hands how it is. I always just kind of get everything together. So I like to make a little log roll it out, then roll that log back together on top of itself, create another log. Do the same thing again, and you do this process over and over until you have the desired consistency that you're looking for for the pasta. Been a good time setting up these cameras today. Kind of glad that I got the, the view that I got on them. It looks pretty nice. If you're wondering what's on the menu today, you can just do exclamation mark menu in Twitch chat and you'll see everything that we're doing today. So I'm only using this little bit of flour here which is why I'm mixing it by hand. If I was using two or three times the size of the recipe, I'd probably use a dough hook and a KitchenAid stand mixer. Now, it is nice to do it by hand, do it the old fashioned way, make everything traditional. But personally, I prefer to do it with the mixer because you're never gonna get as well mixed with your hands as you do with a mixer, not in the amount of time at least. Some people are mixing by hand for 45 minutes, a half hour, for me, that's just too long. I can do it in the stand mixer in about five to 10 minutes. And you want to mix it that long in the stand mixer so it does build up that gluten that we were talking about and have everything going. Now I pressed in and it's starting to come back out. So I'm going to let this rest, but I'm going to let it rest in plastic so it stays nice and humid. It doesn't dry out on me. I'm going to put it back in the book, in the bag that I had over here and start cleaning up my mess. Normally, in a restaurant setting, I'll have a trash can sitting next to me. Today, I have my nice little Rachel Ray bowl. And this being TV land, I also have pre-prepared pasta that I made yesterday and took out earlier on today so it could come up to room temperature. Now you can see this is really nice and soft. It's relaxed. It is a happy dough. It's a very good dough. What we're going to be doing with this dough right here, I'm going to put a little bit more flour down so it can help me roll it out. And then we're going to be cutting it down on this right here. This is called a guitarra or a guitar. It's an old kind of way of cutting pasta in Italy. So it has this one, this one particularly has two different kinds of pasta that I can make. On this side right here, if you can see, it's a little bit thicker, the strands. 
So you can make the pasta a little bit thinner and they will come out like tagliatelle. The other side here makes another kind of pasta that you cook, that you roll out a little bit thicker. And these are a little bit thin, a little bit more together, these strands. So the idea is to get the pasta just as thick as these strands are wide. And that way you can make a traditional dish from Abruzzo that's called macaroni la guitarra, or pasta from the guitar. Today we're going to be doing tagliatelle, because that's the shape that I prefer for my aglio e olio. My family always used uh, fettuccine, but tagliatelle is pretty much just fettuccine that's handmade. So I have a little bit of extra flour here. This is just regular semolina, no salt, no nothing. And I'll start putting that down so I can roll my dough up. Now the other dough that's a little bit finer than this one is nice to use. But it's because it really gives you a very, very smooth product and it's a lot easier to work with when you're trying to build the dough by hand. Now I talked about having different levels of moisture in the air and differences in your pasta. This pasta that I made yesterday, I had to put a little extra egg in it because it was just that dry. Which was weird because it was raining yesterday where I am. Now I keep on adding flour because I don't want it to stick to the board, nor do my fingers. Want it to come out nice and smooth. So I pat it all down, make it nice and flat like I can with my hands. I'll move on to the rolling pin and slowly start moving it out. You kind of want to go for more of a circle for the most part. And you can see while I'm doing this, the flour is being completely absorbed straight into this dough. So you're going to have to be adding flour every once in a while so it doesn't stick to your rolling pin, it doesn't stick to your board or any of the above. Because once it starts sticking, it'll start tearing. And when it starts tearing, you're not going to get the nice uniform shapes that you want. This kind of pasta right here, it could be used for a lot more than just tagliatelle. It could be used for, like I said, pasta la guitarra. This kind of flour I've seen been used for cavatelli, or orecchiette. And those are ones that you make actually with your hand as opposed to using a cutter or a knife or a rolling pin even. I'm going to keep on adding flour here, keep this dough from sticking. And just go nice and thin. The rule of thumb of when it's done rolling out is you'll be able to see through the pasta. Not perfectly but I'll be able to see like the shadow print of my hand through the sheet of the pasta. We're not quite there. You want to try and work it as best you can. Keep everything as even as possible. It's good to have a nice large surface here to work with so that you'll have enough room for your pasta. A lot of times you'll see like the old Italian grandmothers, they'll be making this kind of a fresh pasta and it'll be so big they have it hanging half of it off the table and they work half at a time, move it around, work the other half at another time. That's a, a level of pasta making I have not been able to reach yet. I've been making fresh pasta for a while now. Definitely not quite as long as somebody like that. The last pasta that I made, the fresh pasta that I made, was for the restaurant that I work at. And we made squidding pasta, which in Italian is pasta al nero di sepia. And it came out really, really nice actually. I used the same thing to cut it, except that I didn't use the tagliatelle side. I used the macaroni alla chitarra, kind of a cut style on it because I wanted that thick, really toothsome kind of a, I guess almost like a crunch to your pasta, I guess I would say. Toothsome feel, al dente. And with this kind of a flour, as opposed to a regular all-purpose flour, you're pretty much always going to be getting that al dente feel. Now while you're doing this, you want to have your water going like I do there in the back. All the way up on high heat, so it comes to a nice boil. We're going to be adding salt to it just when it's at the boil, and we're ready to start cooking our pasta. This is starting to come together very nicely, actually. 
I'm starting to see the fake marble countertop through here. All right, now this dough is pretty much perfect. I can see my hand through it. It got really big. It's still nice and thin, but it still has a lot of structure. It has a lot of texture. It's going to be a perfect, perfect dough for our pasta. I'm going to roll it out just a little bit more. Make sure everything is nice and even. We got, for the most part, we got our circle shape that we were going for. And now what we're going to be doing is we're going to cut this pasta just so that we can have it a little bit more manageable for here. As you can see, the uh, size of the kitara is definitely about the same size as the pasta. Not quite there, so we're going to be cutting it so that it fits perfectly on there. Now what I've seen every time that I've used this kitara, I really have only used it once, is when I put the pasta on there and you go to roll it, it starts rolling out a little bit more. So I'm going to cut it shorter than I normally would so that it's going to be able to come out a little bit longer off the kitara than we would be thinking. Right. Keep this nice and floured. Now with the guitarra, when it goes through the holes here, it has kind of like an angled little setup. So everything's going to start falling down through the bottom. And you're going to want to make sure that everything stays nice and floured in there. Because if not, it will start to stick together. This is fresh pasta. It is, it is almost like a living thing. It is constantly drawing moisture from the air and becoming more and more sticky. It's also releasing its moisture. This was in the fridge earlier today. It's, it's definitely up to room temperature now, but it's still producing condensation. All right, so we're gonna start cutting this right now. I wish I could say I had a dough knife or something like that. I don't, but a butter knife works just fine. I'm gonna cut this in half. I'm going to cut my half in half. So we're getting quarters out of this big circle that we made, which is really not that big of a circle. Like I said before, usually when you make pasta, you're making about a kilo. And this is only 200 grams, so that's one fifth of a kilo. So normally this pasta would be five times larger than it already is. All right, so that goes up nicely together. Everything's nice and floured in there. Bring our flowery mess together, push it off to the side here, and we can start cutting. So, I'm going to put it on, and I'm just going to start gently rolling it through. Now, just like it was for when I did it the last time, this is starting to elongate a little bit more. These are going to be shorter than normal strands, but that's really okay. This is a, a homemade pasta. It's not really selling this. Otherwise I would be more worried about being perfect. Take off the side there and we can cut that later. I'm just going to keep on pushing through here. I like to use my fingers a little bit at the end. That's what I had to do last time as well. And just push those through. This all comes straight through. Just working it a little bit. I'm going to put a little more flour on top. Just to make sure that we stay nice and non-stick with the pasta. All right. Now everything is just slowly making its way through. It's actually perfect results right now. Now pasta does swell up a little bit, so you do have to watch out with how thick that you're going to roll it out. You want it to be nice and thin, like I had it, like I said, where you can see your hands through it. Now that I've put a little bit of flour on there, I'm going to put a little bit more. I'm going to start working more pieces on top of it. Just keep on pushing down. I don't have to use that much pressure with this particular rolling pin. It's made of marble, so it's kind of heavy. I would love to have the old-fashioned grandmother kind of rolling pin. It's about a meter long or a yard for us here in America. It's really, really long, but it's... One of the best things you could have for working a large quantity of dough is like I said, the recipe is usually five times bigger. So think of the circle five times bigger. You want something nice and big to be able to move that around with. 
a little bit more here, a little more flour. I'll push the rest of this through. Coming out perfectly. I'm really, really happy with how this came out. And then we're going to empty it all out. And there we have the first little bit of our fresh pasta. Came out in nice little strands. I'm going to lay that off to the side. Everything's nice and floured, so it should not stick together. Should not being the key phrase there. Because in the cooking world, nothing ever really comes out perfect. And we will continue with our four sheets. I'm not forgetting to flour underneath so that the pasta has something to keep it from sticking to the wood. And also flouring on top. So that when it falls through, it's not sticking to itself. Our water is starting to boil. Turn it down a little bit. And keep on cutting our pasta. If you want to put a rag underneath your guitarra, if you have a guitarra, it would be just fine so it doesn't move around like this one is doing right now. And also if you don't have a guitarra, another way that you could do this is to take your pasta, make sure it's well floured so it's not going to stick to anything, especially itself, because what we're going to do right now is fold it over a couple times, make almost like a Swiss roll, and you can just go down and cut. It's going to be a nice rustic shape. You'll still get the strands like we're doing right here. It's the same exact thing. It's just not going to be as perfect, which is just fine. This is homemade pasta. I'm not trying to sell it to anybody. If you want to make it for a restaurant setting, they definitely have plenty of pasta cutters out there. Or you can go old school and use one of these. Now I know they sell these here in America. Personally, I didn't buy this here. I bought this on one of the trips to Italy that I took with my wife. And like I said, I haven't used it very much, but I did use it in the restaurant a couple weeks ago before we had to close down for the coronavirus. And I was really, really happy with the results that I was getting from it as I am today. Now the dough that I had made before, which was a squidding dough, was a lot harder, completely by mistake. Like I said, with nothing really being perfect in the restaurant world, we just kind of make it look that way. I put, I made the dough for a recipe and a half, so one and a half batches, so it was a kilo and a half. But I didn't adjust the eggs for it. I did not have enough egg in my pasta for it to be perfect. And so it came out really, really hard, and I had to work really, really hard to push it through. It came out fine, it had a great texture, great shape, it came out perfect. But it was just that much more work. Me and the boss that I work with were sweating trying to push this pasta dough through here. It still went through just fine, but it was a lot of a lot of work, but you still make it work. And it was funny watching him sweat because he's about 300 something pounds, which is like 150 kilos for everybody in Europe or anywhere else in the world that's not here. Because we're the only ones that do use the metric system. He's not exactly a small guy. You see it's coming out nice and perfect. Now this dough had a great resting time. The other dough that we had just made previously is going to be resting. I'll be cutting it later. But you want to give it at least a half hour to rest for the most part for most of your doughs. But normally you're going to wind up giving it a little bit more than that if you have to use the flour that I'm using, the regular semolina, which is a lot more coarse than a double O type of flour. It just kind of helps with hydration of the flour granules if you leave it a little bit more time. This one I would leave at least, I would leave it at least two hours to make sure it fully hydrates and always in plastic so you make sure that all that moisture stays in there and keeps on hydrating your pasta. Now you can see, like I said, this is 200 grams of flour, but I'm getting a lot of pasta out of this. This is definitely going to be enough for a full meal for two people. Although pasta traditionally is not used as a full meal, it's more of a starter on the high-end kitchens of Italy. A primo piatto, but Everywhere else in the world, including here, this is not going to be our main dish. Today is definitely going to be our main dish. Definitely not going to work this hard just to make an appetizer at the home. I'm 
Now these little kitara are great, but one thing that you have to be wary of is not over tightening your wires. Because if you over tighten them and you're putting pressure on them, just like any kind of a tight wire, they will snap and you can get very, very badly injured. So when you store it, the best thing you can do is loosen them up. They have these two little knobs back here, right here like you can see. You give it a couple quarter turns and it'll loosen it up, make things a lot safer for storage so that you don't break anything. Obviously, I don't want to break anything here. I bought this in Italy. It's going to be extremely hard and very expensive to replace, not because of the cost of the machine, but the cost of the plane fare. All right. So everything's nice and well through. Our other pasta is definitely going to have to wait to be rolled out. There is no way that I'm going to start doing it now. It just has not had enough rest time which is why we did TV land today and we had our pasta pre-prepared. Even by the end of this stream, that pasta is still not going to be fully hydrated, fully relaxed and ready to go. So now you can see we have our nice big bunch of pasta here. It is quite a bit. 200 grams is roughly half a pound. But plus you're adding the eggs and everything like that, so you're definitely getting about a half a pound of pasta. All right. We'll come back here, put our stove back up, a little bit of salt in the water. Personally, in the kitchen, I like to have kosher salt around at all times. Always kosher. I just like to have the, the thick flake on it. Okay. waiting for our water to come up to a boil, get all this stuff out of my way, start working a little bit smarter. So we have our extra flour. The bag that I was able to buy was from Red Mill, I think that was the name brand. Uh, I really don't find semolina around here very often. It's kind of a hard find. I have to go to either the organic markets or a specialty store or anything like that to actually be able to get any ingredients for fresh pasta. That's why at home I actually like to make uh, gnocchi quite a bit. It's a lot easier because you can use a regular all-purpose flour. Also cavatelli, you can use an all-purpose flour. It makes your life a lot easier. I'm going to step off screen for one minute. I'm getting a half sheet pan here. This is where I'm going to be putting the pasta after it's done cooking. Also use it to transfer my pasta over to the water. You can go straight into the sauce, but I like to give it some time to cool down, let everything come up perfectly. So I put all that in there. My water was at a rolling boil. It should always be at a rolling boil. If you get the starch is starting to come up in the water and make that foam and it's starting to come out, you can turn it down a little bit, but make sure you're moving your pasta and everything like that. Personally, when I cook, I like to eat dirty as little as possible. So all I have here today is one saute pan and one pot, one spoon. I'm going to use that spoon just to move my pasta around a little bit right now, so I'm making sure that it's not sticking to itself. Get my colander out. I wish I could say I have a nice pasta colander. This is what I got, so I'm going to use. It worked just fine. Get all this out of my way, and I can bring over my cutting board. Clean up a little bit. Now, fresh pasta does not take nearly as much time to cook as your traditional dried pasta that everybody sees in the stores. Dried pasta can take anywhere from 8 minutes to 14, 15 minutes sometimes, depending on the shape, depending on the size, depending on everything. Fresh pasta is going to be more like, depending, like I said, on the thickness, on the shape, on the size, it's going to be more of about four to five minutes. This particular batch is probably going to be about four minutes. Look, I'm already starting to get the foam here. So I'll turn it down and mix it around. What that foam is, is it's the proteins in the flour that are starting to form together and make this little foam that's come up to the top. So you want to make sure you turn it down so it's not going to throw over the side 
there is really no magic trick. You're not gonna, it's not gonna be putting oil in the water, putting the spoon on top. None of that really helps get that foam down. If it wants to come out, it's gonna find its way out. You want it to keep it at a nice, good boil without throwing out all that protein foam, I guess you could say. Or in Italian, spuma. I'm gonna bring my cutting board over here. So we're gonna get everything ready for our sauce. This is the knife that I have today. It's just a small little, I guess, Antoku style knife that I specially sharpened just for work with vegetables. And since the only thing I'm gonna be cutting today is this head of garlic and two anchovies, this is all I really need. Make sure it's nice and sharp. Bring everything together. This isn't a sharpening steel. It's not going to sharpen anything for you. All it's doing is taking the misaligned part of your blade and bringing it all back together. When you want to sharpen, you need to take away metal. So that means you need a sharpening stone or one of the things that you pull it through, which is going to destroy your knife after time. So you're better off with a wet stone. Personally, I like a wet stone or an oil stone to work too. Now another big thing with when you sharpen your knives is that they are sharpened for the purpose. This one I have sharpened for vegetables only. So this side right here is completely flat. This side over here has a nice slow bevel on it so that it's going to be coming back a little bit further than you would on any normal like chef knife or boning knife or anything like that. So that I go down and it's going to get a straight cut every time. Check our pasta. The best thing that I found with pasta is just break it in half. If you see that it's raw inside, it's raw. And you try it. This is perfect. You want it to stay al dente, you don't want to make mush. So we're going to take this and we're going to strain it out. A lot of people like to save the pasta water. Normally I do as well. But with the semolina flour, it gets you really grainy kind of a, a water, which you could strain out and everything like that, but I'm just not gonna bother with that today. I'm gonna put it on here so it has lots of surface space to drain, well not drain, to start cooling down. And I'll put a little bit of olive oil on it, just a little touch so it doesn't stick to itself. and we'll mix it around so everything is nice and evenly dispersed. It cools down nice and perfectly like we want, and we're ready to go. Now, even if I was gonna serve this immediately, I almost always put oil on there. Some people say not to do it because it stops the sauce from taking on, gripping onto your pasta or anything like that. I've never had this problem. You should always, when you're doing your pasta, put it in the pan with a little bit of the sauce put a little sauce in there and move it around. The sauce is going to be hot enough in the pan or when you just put it on there in a bowl to bring it all together and not have that oily issue. Right. So everything here is nice and well done. That is not going to stick. So today I have for our aliguanolio sauce, now we're going to move on to the next part of our segment. I have some oregano, not fresh oregano. This is just regular dried oregano. This is, um, I bought it on Amazon. Sicilian oregano. It was pretty cheap. I got a gigantic bag of it. We use a whole head of garlic. It's about a medium sized head. It's nothing It's nothing crazy big. It's definitely not elephant garlic. I don't particularly like elephant garlic. I used it one time, never use it again. I have two anchovy strips right here, two anchovy fillets that we're gonna be using. If you don't like anchovy or if you have a fish allergy, you can omit this. Personally, I think it gives incredible flavor. So I always use anchovy. And part of it, it's also part of my grandmother's recipe, so we always use it. You don't really taste the anchovy when you're in it. What you get more of is just kind of a more deep flavor. All right, break apart all our garlic here. And you can crush it, 
to help get the paper off. You don't want to go too far because otherwise you're going to get paper in there. I would have TV landed this garlic, but I wanted to show you guys many different techniques that I use. So you can crush it and take off the tail. Just cut that tail is really, really hard. It's going to go down in cooking, but it's still not something I want to eat. So you can crush it, like I said, to loosen up the paper, or you can start peeling from the bottom. Just kind of get your nail underneath where that hard part is and start pulling up. It takes a little bit longer, but you get a nice full piece like that, and it's not crushed and broken like this one. Another technique that I like to use is to get rid of the hard part on the tip here, and you put it in your hand like this and start rocking it back and forth with some pressure. And what it does is it loosens up the paper everywhere, paper comes right off, and you have a nice piece of garlic. That's my favorite way to do it. I don't always do it like that because sometimes you can't get the hard part off unless you cut it. And also, not all the garlic in the world is going to be perfectly round or as round as this one was. And you can wind up kind of cutting yourself with the hard part of the garlic. Not really cutting, but it's just not very comfortable. But that is my favorite way to do it because it's just, for me, it's the fastest way. So we're going to make sure we have our whole head of garlic here peeled. It might seem like I'm making a bit of a mess, but this all comes up really, really easily, really, really quick. That's why you have to have a nice clean workstation so it's as just as easy to clean as it was to make messy. Sometimes you get the garlic where it has a little bit of trouble getting some of the paper off, which is really why I like to do the rolling technique with my hand because it will get everything off every time. But it does work your hands kind of hard. If your hands are not used to this, it might hurt you. My hands are extremely used to this, so it's not that bad. You'll find sometimes with the garlic, the paper just doesn't want to come off no matter what technique you use. I've seen in Williams Sonoma, they have things that are these little tubes, plastic tubes that do the same exact thing that I'm doing with my hand, except it's a plastic tube with two little cup, cups in it on the side to make sure that nothing comes out, and you just roll it. Same exact principle I'm using here. And that actually is where I came up with the idea to use my hands like this is when I first saw that little machine, not really machine, little gadget at Williams-Sonoma. Unfortunately, this little gadget that's just kind of a little plastic tube and two little ends on it, I think it was like $20 or something ridiculous like that. Being Williams-Sonoma, of course, that was the case. But my hands come free. Not only do they come free, given my profession, my hands also make me money. I'm going to try and get every little piece of garlic that we can in here. Some of the gar little pieces of garlic are going to be gigantic cloves like this. Some of them are going to be min little minuscule guys like this. But they all have flavor. And they all are great for cooking, no matter what the size. For a stock or anything like that, or soups, depending on how I want to use my garlic, sometimes I'll just crush it, paper on, if I'm making a stock, put the whole thing in there. Sometimes I'll just kind of crush the whole head of garlic and put the whole thing in there, paper and all, because you're going to strain out your stock anyway. And if I was making the chicken stock for this recipe, which we're not doing today, I don't have any whole chickens in house. We would do just that. Take the whole, a nice whole head of garlic and do it right in that stock. But we would still be adding more garlic later, being that the recipe is called alio e olio, or in English, garlic and oil. Well, it's called alio e olio al peperoncino. So it's also going to have some spicy pepper to it. I prefer to be able to use hot cherry peppers. Even when I can buy them back in New Jersey where I'm from, you can buy them in almost any store in a jar, and then they're brined, and the brine is actually really good to add it to the sauce as well if you can do it. Unfortunately, down in South Carolina where I am now, there is not the population of Italians that we had in New Jersey. So we just don't have the same products. I could order it on Amazon, but it's a lot more expensive, and just really not worth it when I can use a very similar product, not the same flavor, but the same concepts. And what I'll use is just some regular crushed red pepper.
Like I said, nice clean station, just as easy to clean up as it is to make a mess. So you can almost do this any way you like. If you don't like to have pieces of garlic in your mouth, or if you don't really like the idea of having just a shaved garlic, you can mince it. Personally, I like to see I like to see the slivers of garlic. So they come out like this, nice little sliver. You want them thin, not too thin, not too thick, not too thin, just kind of right in the middle there. And when you're cutting, always keep your fingers back in like a claw sort of form. You're gonna have your thumb in the back that's gonna be able to push the garlic up. Your fingers are never gonna move. The only thing that's gonna be moving is your knife and that thumb pushing everything up. And you can just get stuff done very, very quickly in that manner without ever have to worry about cutting yourself. And you can cut almost any way. I don't really suggest for most home cooks that you lift up the knife from the, from the board like I was doing there, lift up and you get that kind of knocking sound that everybody loves to hear because you think, oh my God, he really knows what he's doing. And you would be right, except that's how everybody gets cut. I've cut myself several times doing it. The best thing you can do is always keep your knife pointed down onto the board and just do a rocking motion. And you just rock and rock and rock. And if you have your hands like that, in the claw form like I mentioned, you don't have to even look at what you're doing. After some practice, don't do it on your first day or the first hour, you will cut yourself. I've cut myself more times than I could count. I don't do it anymore because I really learned good knife skills just from practice and practice and practice. And just from being able to do that, I took what it's going to take a lot of home cooks 10 minutes to do in about a minute. Maybe two. You can tell me if you timed it. Now we have our anchovy fillets. You can keep them shingled like they are at the moment, one on top of the other. And you want to get these almost as fine as you can for the most part, because you want it to dissolve when you cook it. And we're not going to add this at the same time as the garlic. We're going to add the garlic first, of course. But the best thing that you could do when you're cooking is to have all your mise en place, everything in its place. So you have all your preparations done. So that this way when it comes time to use them, you have the ingredient there. You're not going to have anything burning on the stove waiting for you to get your chopping done or anything like that. It's all nice and ready. So it almost made like a paste is what you got here. Now you can use an anchovy paste. I've definitely done that before. I do like it. I just happen to like to have the whole anchovies better. It's just what I'm used to using, but the paste is just fine. I really do enjoy the paste as well in this recipe. A little bone there from the anchovy. All right, let's wash up a little bit. So now I'm gonna turn my heat on the heat I like to use for this one, I have an electric stove, it's going to be at 6. So it's a little bit more than medium. It's kind of, it's not quite medium high. It's a little bit past medium, so it gets nice and hot, but it's not going to burn anything. We want to pretty much just cook these garlic until they are translucent, but you want to cook them for an extended period of time so you're getting all that garlic flavor out of them. Now for this, I'm going to be using regular olive oil, and being that the recipe is called garlic and oil, ayo olio you use quite a bit. I'd say that this is going to be between a quarter and a half of a cup, depending on the uh, amount that you're making. That was all the oil that I had left in the bottle. I wouldn't use any more. You can see it's just like a, it's not quite shallow and it's also not quite deep brine. It's almost like a shallow fry, I guess you could say, is what you're going to be doing with this. We have our spoon back again. We're going to wait for the oil to get a little bit hotter. You want the garlic to start sizzling when it hits the pan, but very, very light sizzle, very slow bubbles, very slow sizzle this way that it's not going to burn when it's in there. It can just start cooking slowly, start sweating out. I'm also going to add a little bit of salt when I put the garlic in there and move it around a little bit. What the salt is going to do is take some of the moisture out of the garlic that it start coming out and this way you getting all that moisture out in there is also going to help keep it from burning. Now if you just put your garlic in there and let it go in the oil, let it go in the oil, let it go in the oil, 
you don't salt it. You can pay attention to it, you can have good results, but you will get better results if you put a little bit of salt in anything that you're frying, anything that you're sauteing. Not quite hot yet, but it's getting there. It's to the point where I feel comfortable putting my garlic in. I'm just gonna push everything in there, move it all around. Like I said, since I don't want to burn the garlic and I don't want it to be like a roasted garlic kind of a flavor or a burnt garlic kind of a flavor, which is much worse. I'm going to put it in now. It's still somewhat cold, but it's not really cold. It's not really hot. As far as the oregano goes, I would say this is half of a teaspoon of dried oregano. You can substitute for fresh. Fresh, you're going to need a little bit more than a dried product. Dried product always has more flavor than its fresh counterpart. And we just gotta wait for our garlic to start doing its thing. Once it starts sizzling, this is when I will be adding the salt in. It's not quite there yet. If this was a regular flame stove, a gas stove, I would be able to have it sizzling by now. Electric stoves, they take a little bit longer to catch up to speed. So keep that in mind, but they also take a long time to cool down. So you have to keep that, all of these things in mind when you're cooking. How hot your stove is going to be able to get, how it heats up, how it cools down. Everything is going to be affecting how you cook. Move everything around so it stays nice and evenly spread out there. I would take it off and show you. I want it to be hot first. The other things that we'll be using for this recipe today is the anchovy that I showed you, the oregano that I showed you, a little crushed red pepper, some regular pepper, the olive oil, and some chicken stock. I'm not showing you brand. I'm not getting any money for marketing, so if somebody wants to give me a sponsorship, I'll turn the, I'll turn the container around. Uh, this is just one quart right here, about a liter. So if you want to use a liter, which is another... 1.8 ounces that's just fine we're going to be reducing this a little bit reduce it by about a third to a half depending on the quality of your stock some stocks have really good quality and you can just put them in straight almost but you're going to put less because you don't want to have this whole quart or liter of liquid it's going to be a lot for two people's worth of pasta now our garlic is now starting to sizzle so we can start adding our salt now you're not going to add a lot just a little bit, say about a good pinch. And start moving everything around. You wanna keep your garlic moving so it's not burning, so that everything is just always constantly coated in the hot oil. Be careful when moving your pan around. You do not wanna have an oil spill. You don't wanna get hot oil on yourself on your stove, you definitely don't want to get it underneath your pan, you'll start a fire. You don't want to get it on the floor where your dog might be laying, anything like that. You keep everything very calm when you're cooking, especially if you have a fire, the best thing that you can do if you have your hood fan on, turn it off, turn off any fans in the room, make sure that you're not giving oxygen to this fire. Do not throw water on a grease fire for the love of God. That will just make things a hundred times worse and you're going to have to call the fire department. Now it's starting to sizzle pretty good. I'm going to move my heat down to exactly medium now. I'm moving it down to the five as opposed to the six. Not a big difference, but enough to where I'm not worried about my garlic burning at all. I want it to just kind of sweat out all of its nice garlicky oils. In case anyone was wondering, if you have a little hole in the tail of your pan, this right here is actually made so you can put a spoon in there. You have one of these nice wooden spoons like I do, which costs about like a dollar for seven of them. You can stick the handle right in there and it holds it right over your oil, right over your stock, whatever you're cooking in your pan without having to worry about dirtying up, for instance, a spoon rest or anything of the sort. And it keeps it close to where you're working and accessible at all times. Keep 
this going here just to show you guys. Don't do this at home. This is where we're at right now with the garlic. It looks like it's deep frying. I'd say that way it was probably, from the looks of it, about between 325 and 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So I think it's about 160 to 180 degrees Celsius. Being a chef, you work with a lot of recipes. When you know that it's going to be a good quality recipe, a lot of the times it's always going to be in the metric system, in the European metric system, because that's where all the recipes came from. Like this recipe came from Italy, obviously. My souffle recipe came from France. All of these different things are definitely going to be in the same kind of measurements of their home country. So you're going to have grams as opposed to having cups or ounces or Fahrenheit or anything like that. That's a good way to know if you're going to have a good quality recipe is if it's... Hey, Hawk, what's going on, man? How you doing? Making some aglio olio. If you want to see the menu, just do exclamation mark menu to see what we're making today. We've already made the pasta, and right now we're making the sauce. You think Hawk would like to get up? This is my catering outfit, so I can actually look nice and professional. So our garlic is getting to the point where it might start browning or it turns translucent. So what we're going to do now is add in the anchovies that we had cut up earlier. And we're going to cook those for just a little bit longer so that they can start dissolving in there. These things are going to disappear into the oil. Move everything around. Get it all together. <laughs> Thanks, man. How you doing, Hawk? You going on stream today? A little bit later, right? About a half hour or so? Or an hour, I think, I saw on the schedule. Alright, so our anchovy is now pretty much completely dissolved in here. Our garlic is about as cooked as it's going to be getting. It's nice and not quite translucent, but exactly where we want it. So it get all of it, it had all of its oils come out. It's where you want it. Not quite to the point of burning or browning, but nice and ready. Always shake up your broth. If you buy broth, even if you make broth, always shake it up. And we're going to add this whole thing in there. These containers are made so that the top is over here, this way that you never have any kind of a glug when it comes out. It's never going to splash. You can always have a nice constant stream without having any real issues. That was all of that. That's been pretty good today, man. Appreciate appreciate you asking. Uh, did a setup for today and just started making this. That's really all I've been doing today. We might get on COD later. We'll see. Maybe some Apex instead. Now I'm putting some fresh cracked pepper in here. Not a whole lot. Maybe an eighth of a teaspoon, I'm going to say. It looks like a lot just because this little thing takes forever to get all the pepper through. Basically until it looks like there's a nice, very light coating of pepper on there. Now the crusher of pepper that you're going to use is probably about a teaspoon. You can measure in your hand a teaspoon or use an actual measure. That is about a teaspoon. If you fill up most of your palm, it's a tablespoon. If you fill up just a little hole in the center, it's a teaspoon. Good general judgments. This is our oregano. We're not going to take it off of the stem. I'm just going to put the whole thing in here like that, like a bouquet garni, which is like a, pretty much herbs in a bag. Put it right in there, and it's just going to start disappearing. All the leaves are going to come off of there, and I can just take the stick out later. Make life a lot easier. Now, we added salt earlier with the garlic, but we didn't add all that much. So we can add a little bit more now and let everything roll together. I'm going to bring it up to a boil, let everything start reducing down, concentrating all the flavors, letting everything come together, letting the oregano let all of its flavor out, letting all the crushed red pepper let its spiciness out, its flavor out. Everything is going to start melding together. All 
right, so Hawk, I know you weren't here for this part. We used this right here, an Italian guitarra, let's call it, or a guitar in English. It has two sides, one that cuts macaroni a la guitarra, which is like a square kind of a long pasta, a long square kind of like quadrated pasta. Or it cuts on this side, tagliatelle, or fettuccine, linguine, pretty much all the same shit. We have our dough that we made today, which I put in plastic so it's not going to lose any of its humidity or moisture, it stays nice and moist. It's starting to rest. It's getting there. It's not fully rested. It's not anything we'll be able to cut on stream. That's why I did TV Magic today and I made some pasta ahead of time and cut it on camera. We parboiled it, put a little bit of oil on it, and spread it out nice and thin on this half sheet pan so that it cools down very nicely. Ah, you, have the, you know what that is? Yeah, well, you're really close to Italy where you are, Hawk. Over here, I, haven't, I didn't see one until I actually went to Italy. I wish I could say my family my family's Italian, but we never actually made fresh pasta at home. And what my grandmother did was usually manicotti, which was just a regular all-purpose flour crepe. We're going to move the heat up on this to about a medium high, so we get everything start boiling and start reducing down. Now once all that's done, you can serve this a couple different ways. More traditionally, it's going to be just a little bit of oil, a little bit of the sauce mixed in with the pasta, so you get all those flavors on there. You get some garlic in there, and you get just like that. Me and my wife, personally, I like to use a lot of more chicken stock than you normally would, and a lot of people don't even use chicken stock in their recipe. This just happens to be my family's recipe, where we do like to have chicken stock to give that extra flavor, extra kick flavor. And me and my wife like to eat it almost like a soup, not quite floating pasta, but not exactly just a little coating either. I worked in Italy for three weeks when I was at catering college, three weeks in seafood restaurant in San Marino. Oh, that's awesome. Did you learn, did you pick up any time while you were there, Hawk? I know where I was talking about, uh, I was talking to you yesterday about being able to speak three languages, but as soon as I said that, you started commenting on something and my headset, and my headset went out. I couldn't even hear anything that you said. But yeah, we, all, we speak English, Italian, and Spanish in this channel. If anybody wants to say anything in any of those languages. Did you pick anything up when you were in Italy, Hawk? Aside from obviously the cooking stuff. So right now we're just waiting on the sauce to come up to a boil and start reducing down. Like I had mentioned before, this is an electric stove. It is the bane of my existence to be able to, to have to cook on an electric stove at home. I'm so used to the extremely hot gas stoves that you have at a restaurant. And this would have been pretty much reduced and done by now. You could almost make this sauce out of minute, which is French for pretty much on the time, at the minute. See, who else we have in chat? We have four viewers. Oh, wow. Yeah, that happens. Everybody forgets the language. If you're not using it, you're definitely going to forget the language. Italian was really hard for me to grab onto because even though my whole family's Italian, I'm the only one in my family that actually speaks Italian. We are making an aglio and olio sauce, which is a garlic and oil sauce. But this is my great great grandmother, my great grandmother's recipe. From I think she was from she was Marcajan, so she was from a little she was a little bit higher than Abruzzo in Italy, so a little bit above the knee on the back side of the knee on the boot. And this is what she always passed down to. This is what she passed down to my grandfather, and my grandfather passed it down to all of his children. I actually learned it from my grandfather. Um, if you want to see everything that's on the menu today, you can just do exclamation mark menu in the chat. Let me see if I could do that. I've never really done this on an iPad. I hate doing iPad shit. I don't even know where my exclamation mark is. Mark is. Forget about it. <laughs> I've used an iPad about three times in my life. Thank you, sir. Yeah, fresh pasta al huovo into tagliatelle, which you have right here. Nice tagliatelle cut. We had the uh, 200 grams of flour for our pasta, 6 grams of salt, 
and I used three eggs in total, one which was a whole egg and two that were just the yolks. And we just mix it all together and we're letting it hydrate right now. I mentioned earlier that this is going to need to hydrate in its plastic for at least a good two hours. You cook for six years, I think you qualify, Hawk. Don't, don't, don't say you're not a real chef. Plus you're doing a cooking stream at least once or twice a week. So you're still, you're still going there. I don't want to hear that you're not a chef. All right, so we're starting to finally boil it here. Start reducing. Now the dried oregano that we have in there is going to start getting a lot softer, start coming off, start letting all of its flavor out. Yup, damn right, real chef hawk. Hey, I just realized we got the same hat, me and your bird. I guess your bird has the catering whites like I do too. This is just, I don't really cater very much, I always work in a regular restaurant, but this is what I've done catering a few times and this is what I bought just so I had something that looks nice. <laughs> Alright, this is one time I would really like for to have smell of vision because this smells amazing. It's starting to, it's boiling pretty good. It's at a nice, nice hard simmer, bringing everything down. Once these flavors are concentrated, I'm going to put everything back into the pot where it was originally and just Put it together a little, with a little bit of sauce, put it in a plate, a little bit on top. You can serve it with Parmesan on top or not, depends how traditionally you want to go. My family sometimes will even put a little, like the, the rind from the Parmesan cheese, we'll put it in here when it's going and it'll give that nice Parmesan flavor all the way out through the whole stock, as opposed to having to put the cheese on top and having your fork covered in melty cheese at the end of it all. And get all that ready actually. So you want to keep on just moving everything around so everything's nice and evenly heated at all times. It's a liquid, but it's still it's going to have hot spots around the edges. It's always going to be colder than right here in the center where it's going to be boiling hard. So just bring everything in. Everything cooks nice and evenly. Just a quick stir every once in a while. Keep everything cooking nice and good. I like that you're in full whites and the hat. Keep that man. Very authentic chef. Shows you're still in the industry too. You need to update your info tab so you can link your socials, more about you, et cetera, et cetera. If you need to handle with any streaming stuff, give me a shout, buddy. I'll definitely give you a shout because I haven't been able to even figure out how to get anything to that info and in, into the info side. Uh, the only thing I can really do right now is edit my, edit my bio. I haven't been able to go into the info side and actually get into that panel and start working it. I've been trying to find every different way to get around to it. I look it up online. And they gave a different way to do it, but I don't know if it's because of the operating system that I have for my computer. I use Chrome OS, which is also killing me with streaming. Otherwise, I've would been streaming from my laptop today. I'm streaming from mobile instead. And it's just kind of making it a lot harder with Chrome OS because Chrome OS does not support Twitch at all. Twitch has to be with Apple or Windows. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate that. I really appreciate it, Hawk. Appreciate the support. Appreciate you coming by. It's always fun having a chat with you. You and a few other people, if anybody else is in the chat, you can come and say hi. I don't bite, unless you like it. All right, so we're almost fully reduced here to the point I wanted to get. The only, I'm only reducing this by about a third or a quarter, depending on the quality of the stock. Like I said, this is actually a pretty decent stock or a broth, whatever it said on the container. I think this one said broth. The only difference between a stock and a broth is a stock is just going to be, in the case of chicken stock, it's going to be water and chicken. That's it. Cooked down, and that juice is going to be the stock. For a broth, you're going to have mirepoix, which is your celery, carrots, and onions, bay leaves, a bunch of other things, salt and pepper. I'm going to tweet that you're live to some foodies that are on Twitch and ask them to check you out, brother. Hawk, I really appreciate that. I really do. You're a lot more out there than I am right now, and I appreciate all the support. So, I'm trying the sauce. It's perfect. Exactly as reduced that you want. You want to have a full flavor of the chicken flavor. 
you can kind of taste the back note of the anchovies, but it's not overpowering. It's not where you think, oh, hey, I'm eating an anchovy. It's just that little extra flavor that you're going to be getting in there. So I'm going to turn this off now. Like I said, that's still going to reduce a little while. This is an electric stove. It's going to keep its heat for a minute. See if my 5K Twitter follow is living. Hey, I know you're at like a, a thousand on Twitch, but that's still better than my seven. I appreciate the Twitter one. I got to make a Twitter account. I have, I've never gotten around to making Twitter. I got to get back on social media. I've, I've gotten so far off of it. And I just started streaming on Twitch, so I need to get back into it. I'm gonna have to make myself an account on Twitter, on Facebook and everything, just for the stream though. It's not a personal one anymore. All right, so I'm gonna put all my pasta back into the pot there. Now I'm gonna get a nice spoon, a nice deep spoon. spoon is beyond me at, the point, at this moment so I'm just gonna pour a little bit in there try and use a spoon if you have access to it for the love of God <laughs> don't be like me fortunately I have a lot of experience working with hot things and I can do this very confidently and we're just gonna mix everything up in there this also works with the oil trying not to make anything uh, stick together so if you wanted to make your sauce and make your pasta and everything ahead of time you would do exactly what I'm doing right now have your pasta cooled and ready to go. Put a little bit of the hot sauce on there, mix it around, let it cool down, and then you can cool it down and uh, put it in the fridge in a nice Tupperware. You can keep it for tomorrow, you can keep it for later tonight on tonight, and you have your hot sauce all ready to go. Everything's ready to go. Or just like this, this has just always been what I've done. You put the hot sauce on there so it helps bring everything together and make sure that you get the flavor of your stock into the pasta. It's um, my pasta has pretty much already absorbed all of what I've put in there. And now what we're going to do is serve in our nice birthday bowl that we have today. And it's nice and pink on the inside too. All right, I couldn't find a spoon, but a very nice pound of tongs. You just take up a little bit of your pasta there. Put it in the bowl. I say this is serving for two, not in this size bowl, but it's definitely a serving size for two if you want to have a nice dinner. I appreciate that, Hawk. I really appreciate the tweet. I really appreciate you coming by. Maybe we'll catch, I'll catch you later when you're on stream. All right. So we put a little bit more of the stock in there. And it's not quite up to the level of the pasta. The level of the pasta is pretty much up to the level of the bowl. The level of the stock is about half. That's how I personally like to serve it. I said it's more soupy than you normally would any other kind of way. But it's my personal favorite. Now you can go from here. And put some nice fresh grated parmesan on top of it. We have our parmesan and nice little cheese thing in the plastic, in the cheese, in the fridge at all times always in the block because when it's in the block I can do what I'm doing right here and save the rinds put the rind in the stocks when you're making them I could have put this in the sauce when I was making it it's an option not one that I always do but it is a good option if you want to have that sort of a flavor so you take just a little bit of this grate it over top just to your liking like I said, if you want to put the rind in there instead, it'll give you that Parmesan flavor like as if you were to put this on top of it already, but it's not going to give you the sticky fork. You could parsley to garnish or anything like that. Personally, I don't do that unless at a restaurant. I'm definitely not going to do it for the house. And there we go. There you have it. We have fresh pasta al huevo, tagliatelle with aloe oil sauce. It's my great grandma's recipe, like I had mentioned. And that is going to be it for today. Check it out next time to see what we have for our next menu. I have to think about it. Any suggestions, you can definitely put something in the suggestion box that I have on my Twitch account here. 
You can also send me a message in Discord. If you do exclamation point Discord in chat, it'll show you my Discord link. Um, if you get in there, you'll be the first one in there. Thank you guys for coming out. Have a great evening. Tu teléfono se descargó y no sé por qué si está conectado. Pero ya había terminado. Yo creo que es de